also a few suggestions that might be interesting. So our next speakers are Stephen and Connor, and they are talking about the Open Reaction database. Um, so please, uh, Brian, you can remove your video, and Connor and Stephen, turn on your video, and you're on. Perfect. Thank you. So um, thanks for, for listening in. So um, in this next talk, Steve and I are going to tell you a little bit about a recent initiative called the Open Reaction Database. Um, and we'll sort of describe our, our goals and give you a little preview of um, sort of our current status and roadmap. Uh, so I want to start off by acknowledging the rest of the leadership uh, within this effort. So both the governing committee and the advisory board have uh, been providing very useful feedback to help define the scope and priorities of this project. Um, I realize that several of you might have also participated in a survey last December or January, where we were initially asking about the types of data um, that we would like to capture when we were setting the scope of the effort. Uh, so thank you if, if you participated in that as well. Okay, so the mission of the Open Reaction Database is sort of phrased quite succinctly, right? So our goal is to support machine learning and related efforts in reaction prediction, chemical synthesis planning, and experimental design. And so that mission manifests itself in a number of more specific goals um, listed here. All right, so something that we're trying to do first and foremost is provide a, a structured format, right? So a schema for capturing chemical reaction data that contains information that is currently or could become useful for these downstream applications in predictive synthesis. Um, we're also providing an interface for uh, browsing and downloading that data. Uh, I think very importantly, that data is intended to be uh, freely and publicly available for anyone to use. So keeping things uh, completely open access with very unrestricted licenses, as Steve will talk about towards the end. And the fourth goal, or the fourth way that this, this mission manifests itself is a little bit less tangible, um, but something that we're trying to do as well is uh, encourage the sharing of reaction data that might not otherwise be shared. Right? So this could include pre-competitive data from for-profit companies where the reactions themselves don't contain any um, sort of IP and that companies are willing to share that data or publish that data. But it also includes um, sort of academic work where maybe there's sets of failed reactions that we don't normally publish, um, but we'd like to start capturing those negative uh, reactions for use again in these downstream learning applications. Now, with this mission and with these goals, we have some non-goals. Um, so non-goals are, are items that you could imagine could be part of our scope, but that we're explicitly saying are not, um, not goals of this effort. So what what we're not trying to do right now is uh, capture reaction processes directly as action sequences. So you can imagine that if we are looking towards um, only automated synthesis as a downstream goal, we might want to capture chemical reactions as action sequences. Uh, we're instead capturing them using conventions and formats that are natural to synthetic chemists. Another non-goal is uh, capturing processed structural analytical data or other inputs that aren't directly related to these downstream efforts, right? So we do want to accommodate raw analytical data in important metadata, um, but for example, a, an annotated PDF, right, of, a, of an NMR spectrum is not something that, that we're trying to capture at the moment. And the last item I think is important, you know, this effort is, is called the Open Reaction Database, and it really is about the database and the data itself. So we're not directly integrating building these models as part of this effort. We want to enable those, and many of us and many of you have interest in, in using this data for those downstream applications, but that's not part of the ORD. So there are two primary use cases that we're initially targeting. And again, this is informed by the survey we sent out last year. So the first is high throughput experimentation. So um, high throughput experiments obviously generate a lot of information and tends to contain many positive, but also many negative outcomes. Um, so in the use case for high throughput experimentation, you can imagine that the status quo might be a spreadsheet that contains information about all the fields that varied and their outcomes. And then maybe there's some sort of templated reaction, right? Some, something that records all of the fields that didn't change between uh, those conditions. And so we're sort of trying to target this use case by allowing this templating 
um, enumeration. So we we want to be able to let users, you know, upload a spreadsheet, upload a template reaction, and then we can automatically generate the hundreds or thousands of reactions that um, they actually performed. A second use case is more of this traditional bench chemistry. So, um, you know, going into the lab, running reactions um, in, in the fume hood. And this is a, a lower throughput kind of setting. And so you can imagine that um, the optimal workflow could involve, you know, a chemist using some more graphical tool to define their data, um, to define the outcomes right, of their reactions, to structure that into a data set, um, which we'll get into later. And maybe when they publish uh, the results of those reactions in a paper, they also include this sort of structured data set in their supporting information. And this becomes one way of capturing all that reaction information that is currently just in, in free text and images in, in SIs. Um, one of the other sort of things we're working on for this last use case is the ability to sort of translate from the structured data format to uh, a more text-based format, um, a sort of an inter intermediate grounds uh, while um, you know, the community still expects text-based SIs. Thanks, Connor. So uh, we wanna take a, some time now and go into a little bit more of the meat and potatoes of how we're actually designing this and also highlight some of the ways that we're using the RD kit uh, as kind of the fundamental uh, method for handling uh, chemical structural data in particular. So um, I wanna review quickly some of the goals that we have for the schema in particular. And uh, the first is, as Connor has mentioned several times, um, we want to capture the most important aspects of, of, of these reactions in a structured format. The whole, the whole point of having a structured data format is that it allows us to uh, facilitate downstream applications so that it's much easier to take these data and uh, export exactly the type of data that you want and do things like looking at quality control and, and distributions of data. Um, and this is heavily guided by the, the survey that many of you participated in. Uh, as Connor mentioned, we're not trying at this stage to capture everything, including all of the processed analytical data that you might uh, have in a structured format, but we do provide mechanisms to annotate this in an unstructured way so that the data at least accompanies the original record and uh, possible future applications might be able to, to make more use of this. Um, we also are trying to match the chemist's expectations here around how things are defined, and you'll see some more examples of that as I, as I dive into some specifics of the schema. Um, an important point here is that we're trying to record what physically happened and really de-emphasize sort of the intent of the chemist in favor of what actually was going on uh, on the bench and or in, or in the plate. And so this is expressed in many ways in the schema, but one in particular that's worth highlighting is that we don't allow you to enter uh, solutions as, you know, concentrations. Uh, instead, we require that the actual masses and volumes that were made, that were used to create the stock solution are provided. Uh, so this, this sort of decouples the reality from the intent. Um, finally, we want the schema to be human readable. Uh, as you'll see throughout this, the, we have a large emphasis on open source and human readability is part of this as well because we're not, we want to stay away from any kind of proprietary or hard to access format. Um, and, and you'll see more evidence of this as we, as we move forward. So if we go to the next slide, I uh, just, uh, okay, he's got out of order. That's fine. Um, the, uh, the, the, the way that we're actually defining things in the schema is with a technology called protocol buffers. Um, this is in the same family of things like XML or JSON. Uh, protocol buffers is a technology that uh, has been used primarily by Google, but is now used in many other applications as well. And it's a way of defining this structured data. Uh, and as you can see here, this is an example of uh, what's called a protocol buffer message or just a, a, a data class, if you will, that defines the mass of something. And so you can see we have enumerations for the different units that might be involved here, uh, and as well as the value and the precision of the measurement itself. And uh, this is just an example of how you can structure very clearly um, the types of data that you're entering into the schema. In particular, protocol buffers are nice because they're fairly lightweight relative to XML. And um, they have a lot of really nice uh, downstream uses because of the protocol buffer compiler that allows you to create bindings for other languages. So for example, if we go to the next slide, you'll see some of the bindings that have been created for Python. So we can compile this protocol buffer message into a, a literal Python class 
that we can then instantiate with value and units. Uh, if we go to the next slide here, we, we've also built additional Python uh, helper libraries on top of the uh, on the top of the protocol buffer bindings that allow you to do things like parse strings into these particular classes so that it's much easier to enter things as you might write them down in, in your lab notebook. Finally, um, you, if you're really like JSON, you can always use JSON to go back and forth between protocol buffers and JSON. And uh, so this is a perfectly reasonable way to, to specify these type of data. So if we go forward again, we see that there's uh, I want to I want to highlight kind of the structure of the schema that we've got going on here in terms of how we're actually laying out uh, all of the information because obviously we're encoding a lot more than just masses of things. So at the top level we have a data set, and this data set represents a collection of reactions that uh, and these might all come from the same publication. They might all be part of the same high throughput experiment, and uh, each reaction in itself is composed of many different subfields that each contain different information. The first column is really describing things that you might uh, in, that you might write down as part of how you're setting up the reaction, what you're putting into it, the conditions that are involved. Uh, and the second column is describing things that sort of happen as the reaction is going on and, and at the end as you're recording product, products and actually looking at things like analytical signals to determine yields and conversions and things like this. Now, uh, if you tab to the next slide, you'll see that the, the underlying schema itself is actually very, very comprehensive. So uh, this highlights um, what, I, what I want to what I want to highlight here is that the the schema can be used at multiple levels of detail. We have this sort of zoomed out detail that was shown originally, where it's possible to specify just the most important things about the reaction, the critical components of what went in and what the conditions were and what came out. Um, but the schema is also detailed enough that when you have the information available, you can go into as much detail as you want to specify what was going on. And so next I'll just show, here's an example of how you might specify uh, a reaction, a set of inputs for a reaction using the Python bindings here. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but just to show that you know it's very easy to use these protocol buffers in this schema in a programmatic way to define things at arbitrary levels of detail. Um, and I'll note that as part of what we're doing here, the RD kit is a critical component of the validations that we're doing. So when we, whenever you can, whenever you create one of these records describing your reaction, we use the RD kit to check things like compound smiles and make sure that they're valid. We also check things like uh, for consistency. So we allow for multiple different structural identifiers like smiles and mole block and things like this. And uh, we make sure that those are consistent. And uh, so our DK plays an important role in making sure that the that, uh, adding an additional layer of validation on top of the, the schema itself. So since one of our you know primary sort of use cases or target audience are synthetic chemists who might be less familiar with Python and less comfortable with this programmatic definition, we've also invested a bit of effort into developing a web interface to interact with the schema and to see the elements it can accommodate right, the fields in the schema in a more visual way. So this is an example when you pull up sort of an empty definition for a reaction, you have sort of a sidebar with all of the different categories that Steve mentioned, and you can see all the different details that you can add, um, including you know, all of this, this additional structure data relating to the addition of an input in this case. All right, so if you have a populated example, you can see a, a reaction summary at the top, we'll revisit that. If you sort of scroll down and you look at each component, you can define you know, smiles identifiers, name identifiers, and then again, capturing the amounts that was added in a structured format. Um, and then we capture outcomes and products as well. So entering uh, you know, what was observed, right, how it was quantified, what the, the summary yields, per, uh, yield purity, selectivity statistics were. So to zoom in on just a couple of sort of areas where we're, we're heavily using the, the RD kit, and this is, I recognize, a, a somewhat lightweight use of the RD kit compared to everything it can do. Uh, when we have users defining compounds through different identifiers, you know, it's of course easier for most of us to review a compound's definition by um, some sort of rendering of that structure rather than its smile string or a mole block, especially. Right, so for example, when we have any change on the form to the identifiers, we have a hook to bounce that set of identifiers off of the server, right? We use RDKit to try to parse any of the structural identifiers 
If it's valid, then we render an SVG, we trim that SVG, we send it back to display it in real time. So as you type to change this, this value field, you'll see the structure change um, with each keystroke. We also want to allow users to draw um, structures. And so we have some integration with Catcher. Right? So in this case, Catcher uh, in, in one of its implementations right, is going to return us a smiles in a mole block. And so a user can draw a structure and we can automatically add then the corresponding smiles and mole block identifiers. We again send those back to the server to check for consistency. Uh, because if we have multiple identifiers that don't actually match, so if you manually changed your smile string after you drew it, uh, we have sort of a warning that these structures don't match. So we sort of rely on RD kit to, to parse them both and compare them. And of course, due to all the, the, the difficulties of canonicalization of molecular structures and, and tautomers, you know, this is a warning, it's not an error. We also have this sort of higher level reaction visualization that again relies on RDKit for drawing. Um, so in this case, we provide sort of a summary view of um, the reaction entry and this sort of tabular HTML table formats. Um, sort of in, in the back end, what we're doing is we're using a Jinja template to build up this, this HTML table. Um, if you're not familiar with Jinja, you can have sort of mix uh, text and sort of Python code. Um, and so in this case, you can see that we have a sort of custom filter defined within this that um, sort of is a function that acts on a compound and uses RDKit to render that SVG if it can parse it and if it's a valid compound. So again, RDKit is, is how we sort of build these summary tables that are sort of essential for um, humans when they browse the data. Thanks. So. Um... I just wanted to spend a few minutes and talk about some of our emphasis on open source and where the database lives and, and its associated code. Uh, everything we're doing is out in the open. So uh, we have this organization on GitHub, the Open Reaction Database organization. And within this, we have a, a couple of repositories that are worth highlighting. The first is uh, ORD-data, and this is where the actual data lives. As, this, as you encode data in the web editor, or if you do it programmatically, uh, we then, uh, data is submitted to the database as a pull request to this repository, where it undergoes manual review um, to make sure that it's both consistent with the things that are going on in the schema, there's automated validations as well as, as manual review there, and also to uh, make sure that we're not getting any, you know, just random data or junk, uh, which, you know, as, as some of you have mentioned in the Discord is certainly something that we want to, to avoid. The second repository is rd-schema, and this is where all the supporting code lives. This is where the schema definitions are. Um, and uh, we, we're maintaining a separation between the data and the, and the code, uh, just for ma mainly philosophical reasons and also for licensing, as, you, as you'll see in a moment. So if we go to the next slide here, um, I also want to mention that we're building a search interface as part of this. We've been spending a lot of our development cycles on uh, the web editor that Connor highlighted, which is really great. And he's put together some tutorials on YouTube, by the way. You should definitely check them out. And um, we're, we're also in the process of building a search interface. Here again, we're, we're heavily relying on the RD kit, in particular the Postgres extension, which has which provides some really excellent tools for doing things like similarity and structure sub-searching. Um, and uh, that this will be a core part of, of the sort of front end and browsing that, that uh, is part of the ORD experience. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit just briefly about some of the legal considerations here. I recognize that um, there are lots of uh, legal uh, you know, minds that can be encountered as you're dealing with this kind of data. And so we've tried to be very deliberate in both preserving open source and also making sure that, uh, that institutions and people who are generating proprietary data can contribute freely. So the code itself, everything in that ORD schema repository is licensed under the Apache 2.0 license, which is a common uh, open access license. Um, the data itself is available under a Creative Commons license. And here we're using a share-alike license so that uh, things that build upon the material have to be licensed on the same license as the original. It's our copyleft sort of, uh, sort of uh, standard. And uh, in addition to these, to these licenses that are applied to the code and data respectively, we have terms of use that have been drafted in kind for us by Google lawyers that explain uh, more terms and conditions for how the, how the data itself is to be, uh, to be used and shared. And, and these are available uh, on, the, uh, or on the GitHub repository as well. 
So finally, I just wanted to mention uh, a little bit about our roadmap. We're currently in alpha testing, where we've spent the last about year building up the infrastructure for defining the schema, working out validations so that we can automate as much as that as possible, working out the submission workflow so that it's easy for people to create pull requests and get data into the database. And the alpha testing phase is really designed to work with a small group of people to work through that process from beginning to end and uh, find any additional bugs and issues that, that come up and, and rough edges. And we've, we've got uh, several people who are contributing during this phase right now, and it's been extremely helpful for, for refining things. We anticipate that in November, we're gonna be able to begin beta testing. And here, the real point of the beta testing is to expand the data that's in the database prior to its official launch, which we anticipate will happen in early 2021. Um, and once that launch actually happens, then we're gonna go wholesale into trying to make sure that people uh, are, are able to use this for downstream applications. We wanna see people using it. We wanna receive suggestions from the community about how it could be better. And most of all, we want to receive contributions of data. And these can come from existing publications that people choose to enter into the web form or programmatically define. They can come from, in, uh, from new data that hasn't been published before. Uh, we welcome it all. And, and we're, we really want this to be the one-stop shop for chemical reaction data and all of its associated downstream applications. Um, if, one more tab here. If, you, uh, if you're interested in staying tuned with the, with the updates that we have here, we have a mailing list, which is a, just a Google group called Open Reaction Database. And um, thanks so much for listening in. I'll leave it to Connor for some closing thoughts, and then I think we can uh, answer questions. Thanks, Steve. So I think probably in the interest of time, um, I'll just sort of reiterate that this is sort of an ongoing effort. We're currently in the alpha testing phase and, and very much looking forward to starting to open it up to the broader community. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. We have a lot of questions from the chat, so I will pick some of them. But actually, you finished a bit early compared to the starting point, so we may go through many of them. <laughs> Um, okay, first question is, um, where do the reaction data come from? I think you started answering this already at the very end. And how are contributions incentivized? Yeah, great question. So um, the type of data we're trying to capture includes both high throughput data and sort of traditional sort of one-off um, uh, sort of bench chemistry data. Now we think that the greatest sort of bang for your buck, of course, is going to come from this high throughput data where there's sort of less of a barrier to defining it in a digital format, right? A lot of high throughput data is, you know, quote, born digital uh, in, in some manner. And so what we're hoping to do is um, sort of change the, the mindset of um, when people generate these high throughput reaction data sets, right? They're going through the effort of defining this Excel sheet. You know, when they release it, hopefully it doesn't just turn into another Excel sheet when they publish it, but they'll decide at the time of publication to also release this sort of structured uh, PB text format is, is what we call it. Um, so we're hoping that sort of looking forward, people will start to do uh, go through this process as part of the publication process. But initially, we do have this um, sort of slight retrospective um, you know, testing where we're taking published data sets from sort of common high throughput papers or, or large screening papers in the literature and sort of pouring through the SI and, and actually um, entering that data in this schema. Um, but hopefully this will be more of a community effort moving forward. Okay, maybe a related question. Uh, so a lot of this data is very similar to an electronic lab notebook that the chemists are anyway filling in. Um, so does it mean that the chemists have to enter the same data again? Um, or are you working on a way to have an automatic tool that would extract this data? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. That's a similarity that's been pointed out um, also by our advisory board. So I might, I might ask Steve to, to speak to sort of the long-term prospects of ELN integration. Yeah, definitely. So. Um... I think that in order to stay true to our short-term goals for the for the database, we're, we're really choosing to focus on making it easy to input data from wherever it comes from. We're certainly excited about the possibility of uh, folks who are generating this kind of data, uh, you know, having the first place that it gets recorded be as a, as a record in the schema that we've defined here. We want this schema to be used in many other places besides just the database itself. Um, in terms of actually 
integrating with ELNs, there's there's a lot of different products out there and offerings, and it's it's not part of our short-term goals to try to fix all of those integrations and make everything tie together nicely. But um, uh, when more resources become available, that might be something we can put more effort into doing. Something we, we are very interested in doing is writing sort of lightweight adapters that sort of translate from whatever the you know, the backend representation of data is for one ELN service, seeing if we can just write a simple script to port that over to, to our schema and have these translators. Nice. Um, there is question about data quality and how do you ensure that what people submit is not just random and whether there is a forced link to a publication, whether there is human curation. Yeah, so uh, let me let me tackle also the, the question about incentivizing publications by providing a DOI. So um, we're not necessarily requiring a link to a publication as part of this, but the review process itself uh, is fairly rigorous. We're, we're, we're still working out exactly what that looks like, but every submission to the database will be manually reviewed. Uh, to one degree or another. There's automatic validations that also make sure that the data isn't total garbage, but our reviewers are going through and actually comparing the things that are submitted with what's in a publication, or if a publication is not available, then you know we need to build relationships with those people to understand that we're not just getting stuff that was made up. So there's, there's definitely um, a manual component here, and, and it's not going to be perfect, um, but it's something that we can improve over time. And, and oh, just for the DOI thing, uh, you know, certainly we want to encourage, we want to make it possible for people to be acknowledged for the contributions that they make. And so creating DOIs for specific data sets or for the data set as a database as a whole uh, is definitely something we're considering. Cool. Maybe one last one um, uh, that's also about data. So. Do you have guidelines or requirements or on how to fill in the different properties? Because maybe some chemists might consider that a substance is a solvent and others say it's a reagent or others don't annotate this kind of information. Yeah, so we, we are still trying to put together guidelines in those cases of ambiguity. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll emphasize is something that Steve said, right? We're trying to capture what actually happened rather than the intent. Right, and so we do have reaction role fields for, for substances that are added. Um, but I, I would say that if you know the identity of the species that were added and the amounts that were added, that amount of data sort of overrides an, an annotated label because there isn't consensus necessarily among what you what you call something, right? If you um, add a quench, that could be a solvent or a quench or a workup step. Um, so I think there's there's some some lack of standardization that we're not trying to address. We're trying to sort of adapt what we are doing to existing standards and conventions in chemistry rather than impose our own um, in, in cases where there's legitimate ambiguity. Perfect. 